President Trump's meeting with Lou Her today should give us some read on how things are going in trade talks. Welcome now, Alessia DeLongas. He is Oppenheimer Fund's multi-asset co-head and portfolio manager. And David Bonson, He's the Benson, Bonson Group founder and CIO and author of The Case for Dividend Growth, Investing in a Post-Crisis World. So welcome to both of you. Let me start with you, Alessio. Let's start with the base case right now, which I think basically people are thinking will put up their sort of five memorandum of understanding. They think they're going to get an architecture, a general overall sort of sense of where we're going without a lot of specific agreements. Is that where your base case is? And what's the upside and the downside? Um, that's our base case as well. We think that's what's going to happen, and we're going to get, bottom line, no tariffs on March 1st. Are we going to get the one-and-done resolution on trade talks, and this is no longer a problem? No. Um, we are going to be able to basically m move forward from this. And I think, as, as we were mentioning earlier, cautiously optimistic is really what the market has been thinking. If you think about the, the low that we saw on, around Christmas, the market has been lifted by two things, imp improving sentiment around trade policy, and the Fed dovish turn. At that point, you know, a 15, 18% rally in a span of six to seven weeks speaks for itself at a time when the economic data globally has been weakening substantially. So I think this is more going to be a buy the rumor, sell the fact type of situation, even with a good resolution on this meeting. Well, so far the, the chart kind of backs you up. If you come inside the Bloomberg here, the white line uh, shows the U.S. companies that have exposure to China, and then the blue line shows earnings revisions, and they've both been climbing higher. I mean, you've seen a huge rally uh, in the last couple of weeks. David, do you agree? Is this you want to you want to sell this chart or what? Um, it isn't so much. I want to sell it because I think the fundamentals even beyond the trade issue are still reasonably good for U.S. equity investors. The, the issue is that we were oversold based on trade fears. Those alleviating justify the rally we just had. It is asymmetrical risk reward. I totally agree with Alicia. I think that at this point, if you get the status quo announcement that people expect, that's priced in. But one thing I thought was interesting, what Taylor had up about the economist expectations, no one's expecting the tariffs to come backwards. True. Now, and I don't believe they will, but that's something markets have certainly not priced in. What if they actually undo last year's tariff increases? That's something I think could be very bullish. Okay, so let's be a little more specific. Give me the over and the under. Let's assume, for example, on the overside, uh, that in fact President Trump says, you know what, I'll take back off the 10% while mm -hmm. we negotiate this. How much gain would it be? Well, I think that, that you could have a, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a, a, a best laughing. guesstimate. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to throw in the number. <laughs> There's only risk there. Uh, you know, uh, it could be worth over a span of uh, one or two quarters, uh, maybe 10, 15 percent. Uh, because at that point, the, 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 the op modus operandi of the market would be, well, then you start testing new highs and, uh, and you eliminate recession risks, and given the Fed has already done a dovish turn. See, I would, I would add to a bullish argument if the trade deal were to go as well as we could hope it to go. The issue that uh, we need is this capex in the United States, that I believe that business investment, which was skyrocketing in the Trump administration, late 2017, first two quarters of 18, it completely went away in late 2018. And I don't believe I've been able to find a justification for why other than trade war theory, uh, fears. You get some of that capital expenditure back in the market, and, and the productivity increases you can see could add a couple innings to this expansion. So when we wind up looking at the rally we've seen in certain sectors in the market in the last month that's been led by industrials. It has. Um, do you feel like that was just we were oversold, therefore industrials rallied, or that there's part of this play you're talking about? See, I'm being more uh, even big picture than that. It's not just the immediate impact to, like, the industrial companies, for mm -hmm. example. It's broad economic growth that I think could come. It would constrain inflation pressures. Unit labor costs would be held in place. You get more productivity, more growth. I think it would impact all sectors in the S&P over the next couple of years. So, let's say that's the over. I won't hold you to the 10 to 15 percent, but give me the under. Is it symmetrical? Suppose they walk away from this and say, you know, we didn't make progress. We are going to increase the tariffs come March 1, which is only a week from now, for goodness sakes. No, I would say it's asymmetrical because at that point, if, if, if you get... If you unwind the constructive sentiment around trade policy, you have to, first of all, close the gap between the market and the meaningful deterioration that we had globally uh, in the economic data. And, and you also find yourself in a situation, you know, we've, we've spoken about the U.S., but if you look at Europe and China, that's where the biggest gaps have been. That's where 
you know, the stimulus from, from China, we are waiting day by day to see the stimulus that we saw in, in the fall to start crippling through the data, and it's not happening. And in Europe, we actually don't know if there is much more stimulus that we can provide. So there, especially on foreign markets, I see more downside, and, the, uh, and part of that will, will transmit to the U.S. So again, if you want to touch numbers, uh, it, looking at where the lows are today, where they've been, that's already by itself a 20% gap lower, right? So I think it is asymmetrical, which is also consistent to where we are from a positioning standpoint and how late we are in the cycle. So if we wind up getting, uh, David, sort of w your scenario that you pointed out, that would be more reflationary if they rolled back the tariffs, except that that's not priced in, uh, is the U.S. going to still be the place you want to be? Or you, is that an EM play? Is that going to be better for Europe? Therefore, you want to buy Europe. Well, it's not going to be better for Europe, and Europe has other issues yeah. altogether I think we're going to talk about later. I think that EM would benefit immensely, although EM has also benefited benefited from the Fed, and you mentioned that other issue. It, really, the market sell-off had this trade issue, but the Fed was probably even the larger factor from our standpoint. The EM world now, if the dollar holds in place, it doesn't even have to retreat, but for the dollar to just stop increasing allows some EM sentiment to come back in. So I think U.S. and EM were less England on more developed international, mm -hmm. including Europe. Our Los Angeles Oppenheimer Fund. Hold that thought. We're going to get right to it. And David Bonson of the Bonson Group will stay with us. Well, staying sort of with autos, Germany's economy down, not out. So on the one hand, you have business confidence uh, falling to the lowest in four years. You also had output in the fourth quarter stalling, really hit by inventories. Part of that is going to be the auto story. On the flip side, consumption and investment actually picked up. So with us, Alessio DeLongas of Oppenheimer Funds and David Bonson of the Bonson Group. How do you understand the data read that we got from Germany today? I think your read is, is the right one. We need, today, we, it's really all focusing about the forward-looking service, the IFO and the PMIs that we got recently. Those are the indicators, really, that you want to focus on. Uh, with respect to Germany, it's really all about external trade. It's all about external demand. Domestic, dom the domestic side of the equation just holds up as a result of credit growth being on par with nominal GDP growth. And you, we, should, we should expect that to stay stable but we shouldn't expect really a major contribution on a going forward basis. The delta really comes from the external sector. The surveys are not encouraging, and they carry a three to six months lead with respect to what's to come. There, what has been the biggest responsible for this drag? The collapse in intra-European trade, the collapse in broader European regional trade. We put a lot of emphasis on emerging markets and China, but if you break down the numbers, the biggest drag to external trade has been the drop in exports to the UK, the drop in exports to Turkey, and the surrounding region around Europe. Second in line, emerging market Asia. Okay, David, Alessio has been asking for those numbers. We're going to put some numbers up here, actually, on the sentiment issue, which is the forward-looking one, as opposed to rearward-looking. And this is what we're seeing, basically, with German business pessimism. We got some iPhone numbers out this morning that were around 98.4, something like that. Not real encouraging. Yeah, I can make it worse for you if you'd like. <laughs> this is all before the monetary tightening has begun. The fact of the matter is that this is after the monetary bazooka of Draghi over the last several years, and you still have this tepid of economic data, um, and Germany is the star compared to Italy, Spain, France, some of the others. It's a very bad situation in Western Europe. Uh, so push back on that in two points. One, what we did see is public spending uh, at 1.6 percent in the fourth quarter, the best since 2016. Unless you are we looking at some kind of fiscal, uh, loosening fiscal uh, spending that's going to come into Germany is going to help prop this up. We can get that on the margin, but I don't think that the, the deltas, the, 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 the amount can be large enough to offset some of the headwinds that we're seeing. But if we get a trade issue with China, a trade deal with China, can the combination Absolutely. So, if okay. you, it, it, so the biggest the, the volatility is really coming from the external sector. If you get the improvement on that side, you, the compounding of of stable domestic demand, including the fiscal spending, as well as the external side, can really lift the cyclical outlook for Europe. But. The, the question is really about, and then, and then what next, right? After we've deployed the monetary bazooka, we've gotten loan growth to the private sector, be it consumers or corporations, of about 3.5%, yeah. nominal, year on year. That's pretty much nominal GDP. So after everything that we have done, we haven't gotten excess credit growth 
to fuel further domestic demand. So the, Europe remains in a somewhat very savings orient. I call it the Japanification of Europe. Uh -oh. All of this sounds very familiar with what we've seen in Japan, right? Very large monetary stimulus, mon nom and, and, and suddenly we need to focus on nominal GDP statistics rather than real GDP statistics. And again, to make it even worse, in the Japanification, at least they control their own currency. See, in Europe, they have all of these countries of different interests and different economic particulars all constricted by a unified currency that doesn't allow for some of that variance that didn't even really help Japan much, but certainly was at least one weapon that European countries won't have. But I think the public spending issue you bring up, at the risk of sounding too ideological, I don't think that they are going to grow their way out of this in the public spending side. They need the productive growth aspects of the economy to really see improvement. Which raises the third issue. We've talked about monetary policy, we've talked about fiscal stimulus. We have not talked about fundamental reform, reform of uh, work laws, things like that. Mm -hmm. Things that, in fact, Mario Draghi kept asking for as he was stimulating the monetary side. We're doing this for you guys. Fix it. And if anything, it seems like politically, the various nation states are going the other way. They, they are going the other way. You no longer have that uh, leadership figure. If you think about Europe, if you, if you said Europe a couple of years ago, you immediately thought about a leadership figure, Merkel, that would bring the consensus together and also uh, overcome some of the dogmatism within the ECB. Today, you don't have that figure, and all the major countries are really dealing with inward-oriented problems. Macron in France, same thing with Spain with the recent political turmoil, and don't get me started on Italy, right? Everything is inward looking. So uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, structural reforms, lab we know in Europe we really go down to labor market reforms and, and, uh, and infrastructure spending. Um, that's not really reform, but it's the side of fiscal spending that really matters because if we start writing checks, uh, it, that's not really going to change anything. But if you start stimulating the economy through a, what, what's the Juncker plan, the broader European infrastructure spending initiative, coupled with, fisc with, with structural reforms, that could provide some light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, first he's got to get around Brexit, though. He's got to get that well, out of the yeah, way. He's got that little too, yeah. on the table. <laughs> tiny, going tiny on detail. Issue there. All right, let's do the longest of Oppenheimer Funds and David Bonson of the Bonson Group. Guys, thanks very much. Great conversations this morning.